How many of you have kids or had kids? Maybe your kids are grown and gone. Many of us share that in common. Um, Abby and I, just a few months ago, entered into a new phase of parenting that has taken our prayer life to a whole new level. (laughs) How many of you parents can relate with that? Yeah, so what happened? Well, we started teaching our oldest child to drive. That's right. It's, it's that time. And um, can I just tell you, going into this, you know, this is one of the things in life you see coming. I, I've known this was coming for some time. We scheduled his, his appointment at the DMV months in advance. And, and going into this, I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to be the coolest, calmest, most laid back dad ever. I mean, I imagine myself just sitting over there in the passenger seat, cruising along with my son with our windows down, and our hair blowing in the wind, and me just passing my magnificent driving skills on to the next generation. Can I tell you, like many things in life, the way I dream it up in my head hasn't really been the reality of what happens when you're out there doing it. I find myself, when he's driving, I find myself holding on to things. I didn't even know we're in my truck. I I find myself a little um, tensed up. I I, I find myself, um, uh, for sure, from his perspective, and he's so sweet, he hasn't said a word, but I'm sure from his perspective, I'm, I'm very overbearing and bossy as he's hurling us down the road at 75 miles an hour. <laughs> or if, if, if he's just cruising us through town at 20 or 30, it doesn't really matter, um, trying to make sure he doesn't kill us both. And, and honestly, he's a really good driver. If I'm being just totally honest, he is a really good driver. He's incredibly cautious. He makes good decisions. He's, he's, he's very sure of the rules of the road, and he knows what he's doing. But as I've been trying to tell him, not everybody else follows the rules of the road, right? Um, so you can't expect them all to follow everything to the, to the letter like you're doing. But still, there's a lot going on when you're driving, and I think we, we tend to forget that because many of us have been doing it for so many years, and it's just like second nature to us. But But when you're sitting there and you're watching somebody new absorbing it and doing it for the first time, you realize again how much there is to think about and how much there is that can go wrong and and, and how many possibilities there are for everything to fall apart. You know, there are a lot of different phases of driving. And as we've been uh, doing this together, some off and on over the last few months, as I'm sitting there watching him and, and watching what's going on around me, I've, I've kind of been realizing again how many different phases there are to, to any trip you take uh, in a car or in a vehicle. And one of the most dangerous phases of any driving experience you have is the intersection. Intersections are extremely precarious. You know, this week I was thinking about intersections because that's what we're talking about and um, I was thinking about all the different intersections in life, but, but I was also thinking about the intersections that we drive by. I was overwhelmed as I started looking around at how many intersections there are on our roads. I know this is going to be really hard for the people listening on the radio and the people watching on the internet who aren't familiar with our geographical area, but for those of you who are, y'all know where the airport is, Right? It's just right down this road over here. It's a straight shot. It's about two miles from where the church is. Just this week, I counted all the intersections between here and there. How many do you think there were? Six, two, eight, three. Would you be surprised to know there are 32 intersections from where you turn out of the airport onto what we call airport road? to turning into our gate, there are 32 different places that there's an intersection, that one road meets another. They're everywhere. 
That's just between here and there in that short little distance on a straight road. You know, the Federal Highway Administration reports that over 50% of all fatal accidents happen where? Intersections. Incredibly dangerous. And you know what? There are also not, not, there's just not just a lot of intersections on the roads we drive on. There are a lot of intersections in life. Have you ever come to a crossroads in life? Have you ever come to a, an intersection in your personal journey with Jesus or as you're walking through this world? We all have, haven't we? Because they're just as numerous as the ones we pass by on the road, and they are just as dangerous too. I want to give you a few reasons why intersections on the road and intersections in life are so dangerous. And you might want to write these down. They're the first blanks at the top of your your bulletins. The first reason they're dangerous is because you have to navigate when you come to an intersection. On the screen, we'll put up a a picture of a complex intersection that, that you might have to navigate on the road. Lots of different ways you could go, overpasses and underpasses and exits and entrances and all kinds of stuff has to happen for you to navigate an intersection like that. But you know, many of the intersections we face in life are even more complicated than that. You see, when you're driving and you you get out on the highway, pick your highway of choice, and you've got 250 miles still to go, or 150 miles, or 400 miles still to go, you can just kind of cruise, man. You can just kind of put it on cruise control and pass people occasionally and just sit back, and and you just know, hey, this is where I'm at, and this is what I'm doing for the next 250 miles. It's, It's not that complicated. But when you come to an intersection, you are forced to navigate. You have to make decisions. You have to change lanes. You have to decide if you're going to exit. You have to merge. You have to yield. You have to accelerate. You have to decelerate. And it can be difficult and it can be extremely dangerous there at the intersection. In the same way, when we face the intersections of life, we're forced to navigate them. And it can be uncomfortable and it can be difficult. There's another reason why they're, they're difficult, and it's the word anticipate. When you come to an intersection, you have to contend with other people. You have to contend with other vehicles. You have to anticipate what they're going to do. Because, yeah, in a perfect world, everybody would follow the rules to a T. Everybody would follow the rules and do what they're supposed to do. But we all know from driving that's not how it works, is it? That's one of the things I've been trying to teach my son as we drive around is you've got to not only know what the rules are, you have to also be able to anticipate what everybody around you is going to do. And that just comes with experience. Are they going to yield? Are they going to let you merge? Are they going to let you come in? Will will they stop at their stop sign like they're supposed to, or are they just going to tap the brakes and roll through? Are are they going to stop at the red light? Or are they just going to blow the horn and flash the lights and come on through? Right? What are they going to do? You have to anticipate what's about to happen. Because even if you're following the rules and your light is green and you pull out there and you fail to anticipate that that truck or that car or whatever it is isn't maybe isn't going to stop because of how fast it's going, it can be the end of your life. Because intersections are dangerous. Who knows? Maybe they're on their phone. Maybe they're jamming out to their favorite song on the radio. Maybe they're just had a bad day at work and they're going through all of that in their head and they're not paying attention. Like you've got to anticipate that something could go wrong. There's a level of of accurate anticipation that is necessary to successfully navigate any intersection on the road or in life. Intersections in our personal lives require anticipation too. Intersections in our professional lives, our recreational lives, our spiritual lives, any any part of our life require a level of anticipation that is built upon experience walking through life as to what's about to happen and how other people are going to respond and how then you should respond at that intersection. That comes with experience, it comes with prayer, it comes with having a deep understanding of God's word and an intimate relationship 
with him and, and asking him to help you in those moments. But really and truly, there's, there's still a lot of unknowns at the intersections of life. A lot of unknowns you have to account for and on some level, in some way, be able to anticipate. The third reason they're dangerous is the word deviate. Intersections are places where we change directions. Maybe you were heading north or south or east or west, but now it's time to get off at an intersection and head a different direction so you can end up at your final destination. Intersections are places we take turns. They're places we go a different way than we were going before. And that's what happens at life's intersections as well when we come to those crossroads in our life. When our life intersects with something else, maybe something we anticipated or maybe something we didn't. That's what happens when your life intersects with cancer or heart failure. When your life has an intersection with divorce or job loss or an unexpected pregnancy. Or even good things, it doesn't always have to be bad things. Even good things can put us at an intersection in life where we have to change direction. Maybe it's a job opportunity that's going to take you to another state. That's going to require you to pick your family up and move them and pull the kids out of school and put them in a new school and sell your house and buy a new one and all these other things. It's a great opportunity, don't get me wrong, but it's a major intersection in life where things are going to change. Maybe it's that sweet moment when he gets down on his knee and he opens that ring box and he says, will you marry me? That's a great intersection, amen, ladies? Some of you are like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but in that moment, you thought it was. It's a great intersection. But things are going to change. Life is going to change. Your name is going to change. Your address is going to change. Everything's going to change for both of you. Maybe it's an expected pregnancy. I remember the first time Abby told me that we were going to have a baby. That was a great thing. I remember the second time and the third time too. They were all great things. But I also remember thinking, uh, things are going to change. And I had no clue how much. But it was an intersection that had to be navigated. It was a, an intersection where there was anticipation that was required. It was an intersection where we deviated and had to change course and change plans and reevaluate. Maybe it's a good thing, like you sell your business or you sell a patent or you write a book or you get 10 oil wells drilled in your backyard and all of a sudden you have more money than you ever thought you would have in your life. It's a good thing, but it's an intersection that now all of a sudden requires you to change course and direction and look at life differently. You see, there are good things and there are bad things, but there's still intersections that will in some way cause you to deviate from the path you were on. Our text today comes from Luke Chapter 19, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open there with me. It involves Jesus and a man who was the chief tax collector of Jericho. By show of hands, how many tax collectors do we have in the room today? Any of y'all work for the IRS? Even in a crowd this size, we don't have anybody? We might, they just don't want to raise their hand. That's the truth. You can tell nobody you're working for them, are you? Because just like way back then, we don't like tax collectors, do we? How many of y'all like tax collectors? That's what I thought. Nobody. <laughs> You've heard, there's lots of jokes about tax collectors in the IRS. Have you heard the one, what's the difference between an IRS agent and a mosquito? Have you heard that one? It goes like this. One is a blood-sucking parasite. The other is an insect. Ooh, ooh that hurts. <laughs> or, or what's the difference between an IRS agent and a taxidermist? A taxidermist only takes the skin. Ouch. 
church. We don't have real high regard for, for IRS agents, do we? Tax collectors. Now, I can assure you, the people of Jesus' time had even less regard for their tax collectors. If we're being honest, I'm sure there are many modern-day tax collectors in our country that are good people. Many of them are probably worshiping somewhere today. They love Jesus and love the Lord. They're good people. They're moral people. They just they have a job to do too, right? But in Jesus' day, that wasn't the case. Tax collectors had a very, very bad reputation. Read this text with me. Luke 19, 1 through 10. He, being Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through, just like last week. Jesus is just moving along on his way. He's going from one place to another. He's passing through, verse 2. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able to because of the crowd, since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus, since he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. So he quickly came down, and he welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it began to complain, he's gone to stay with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I have exhorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. In verse 9, Jesus says, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Jesus acknowledges that Zacchaeus was lost, and he also, at the same time, acknowledges that he is now saved. Jesus was just on his way from one place to another, And he runs into this tax collector, and this tax collector, Zacchaeus, is at an intersection in life. This is a bigger intersection than you can probably realize. It's a bigger intersection than you might think. Jesus is just passing through Jericho, and and most of us know Jericho from the Old Testament, when the walls came tumbling down. But Jesus here, on his way from one place to another is now going to deal with a man one at a time, Zacchaeus. Yeah, we know Jericho is a place those walls came tumbling down, but for those of you who've traveled to the Holy Land with me, we've stood there, haven't we? We've been there in Jericho. We've looked at those walls, and we've talked about this city. Jericho is more than just the place the walls came tumbling down. Jericho in Jesus' day and in biblical times was one of the biggest intersections in the world. Jericho sits out in the middle of a desert. It's desolate. There's nothing for miles and miles and miles and miles and more miles around. But there in the middle of the desert is this little oasis called Jericho. It's one of the most lush and vibrant and fertile pieces of soil on the planet. It made Jericho a rich crossroads. There in the middle of the desert... Multiple roads came into Jericho, going to and from different parts of the world. The amount of goods that have passed through Jericho, our minds can scarce imagine. Jericho there in the middle of this desert, this oasis is filled still to this day with palm trees. Everywhere you go in Jericho, everywhere you look, there are these lush, vibrant palm trees growing all around. Josephus, the historian, called it a divine region. He said it was the fattest in all of Palestine. Jericho was known to the ancient world for its large and lush rose gardens. And still to this very day, it's known to produce some of the best dates in all the world. Every time I go to the Holy Land, I ask Abby what she'd like me to bring back. And you know what she says? As many dates as you can pack in your bag from Jericho. She loves those dates. But you see, all of this made Jericho what? A major wealthy 
intersection, a major wealthy city. There was a reason Jericho had those big walls. There was a reason it was such a fortified city. It was a rich city. It was a lucrative place because it sat at an intersection in the middle of the desert. The only way to get from there to there and there to there and there to there was through Jericho. You see, he was not just the chief tax collector. No, Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector in one of the wealthiest areas of the world. And that made him very, very rich. It's why Luke goes to the trouble. He says he entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. And he was rich. Being rich is not a bad thing, but being rich also doesn't make you everything, does it? I mean, obviously, just from Zacchaeus' life, we can see that he was rich, but he wasn't happy. He was rich, but he wasn't satisfied. He was rich, but he wasn't fulfilled. He was rich, but he was not saved. He was rich, but he was not ready to die. You see, if Zacchaeus teaches us anything at all, it's that it's very possible to be rich and still be lonely. It's very possible to be rich and still be lacking. It's very possible to be rich and still be longing for more. And it's very possible to be rich and still be lost. Zacchaeus knew that there had to be something more. He knew that there had to be something more to this life. And so he hears that this man named Jesus is passing through, and he wants to take a look. He wants to see who he is. And it's from this story, I want you to learn a couple of things about the intersections of life that have to do with you and me and everybody we know, because if there's one thing I know, it's that we're all going to have to navigate intersections as we go through life. Here's the big idea for today. What Jesus did for the man before us, He will do for any one of us. We need to remember that. We are going to see that today. What Jesus did for the man before us, he will do for any one of us. So what do we need to know about the intersections of life? First, you need to know how to identify them. It's probably the most important thing. You need to know how to identify the intersections of life. Have you ever missed your intersection when you were driving? Or have you ever been following that blue or magenta line, whatever it is on your GPS of choice, and the exit was closed for construction or there was a wreck or something and the GPS didn't know about it yet, and so you had to pass by it and get rerouted? If you've ever missed your intersection or had to go to a different intersection, can I get an amen if that's just a real pain? That's a pain, man. What happens when you fail to identify the intersection you need to get off at or on at or your GPS for whatever reason can't take you through that intersection? What happens when that, when that takes place? Well, there's probably a detour required now, right? And that detour is going to cause a delay. You're going to get off schedule. You're going to get frustrated. In some cases, a lot of other people probably miss that exit again because of an accident or a construction closure or whatever else. And so now there's an increased delay because everybody's on the same detour. And it just becomes very, very frustrating, very, very fast. One of the most important things you can do is be able to identify when you're approaching some kind of intersection in life. Zacchaeus was smart enough to know and to recognize that his life was at an intersection. We're not given the details of why or how, but we're given enough information here to see that Zacchaeus knew there had to be something more. He had a sense inside of him that that with all that he had and with all that he was and with all the power he had gained, with all the money he had acquired... It still wasn't enough. There was still something missing. There was still something more. Zacchaeus probably could not identify it. He probably could not explain it if you asked him to explain it to you. But he was able able to know that something was coming or that something was needed. And because of that, 
He wanted to do whatever he had to do to put himself in the path of Jesus. When he heard that Jesus was passing through, he said, I need to see who this guy is. He entered Jericho, the text said, and was just passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus who was the chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was trying to see who Jesus was. But he was not able to because of a crowd, a big crowd that's all around Jesus, and because he was a short man. And verse 4 says, So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. He was trying to see who Jesus was. He, he had a sense inside of him. He had identified that this was an intersection in his life. And he needed to see, lay eyes on, try to figure out who Jesus is. But there were two problems. A big crowd and Zacchaeus was a small man. But nonetheless, he was still trying to see who Jesus was. So what did he do? He climbed up a tree so he could get a look at Jesus. Just so he could see him pass by was his only plan. Now how silly is that? If you're a grown man, would you identify yourself by raising your hand real quick? Grown men, raise your hand. Good, we got a good number of grown men in the room. That's great to see at church. Now, now if you just raised your hand, grown men, can I ask you how many of you climbed a tree recently? Not a one of us. I, oh, I missed one. Over here, Jordan climbed a tree recently. Yeah, I don't know if you're a grown man. <laughs> a lot in common with Zacchaeus. We little men. No, I'm, I'm kidding, Jordan. I'm messing with you. Love, Jordan. Okay, one among us has climbed a tree for work, he, he proclaims. But... This isn't normal activity for grown men, is it, grown men? This isn't something you do every day. You don't wake up and go, I think I'll go climb a tree today. This is strange activity for a grown man, and it would have been strange activity in Zacchaeus' day too. But Zacchaeus knew that his life was at some kind of intersection. He had identified that, and he said, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to see who this Jesus is. He didn't want to miss his opportunity to try to figure out what was going on in his own life at this intersection he was at. Well, he had heard about Jesus before, most likely. I'd ask myself the question this week, I mean, what would have led Zacchaeus to go to all this trouble? Why, why would he have climbed that tree? If you go back in the Gospel of Luke a little bit, you can see that Jesus has had an encounter with another rich man in Luke 18, for example. You remember the conclusion of that? If you look there in your text in verse 24 of Luke 18, it says, Seeing that he became sad, Jesus said to this rich man, How hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Had Zacchaeus gotten the word about that recent teaching of Jesus? Had he heard Jesus say those very words? Had he been in the back of the crowd listening to Jesus before? We don't know. We're not told. Or was it the blind man? Was it the crowd and the blind man? Was, was Jesus passing through Jericho whenever he comes to this blind man? And was Zacchaeus in that crowd shuffling along in the dust? Shuffling along down the road with everybody else trying to get a look. When that blind man cried out from the crowd and Jesus had that one at a time moment with him at that intersection of his life. Had Zacchaeus heard Jesus say in verse 42 of Luke 18, receive your sight, your faith has saved you. And instantly he could see and begin to follow him glorifying God and all the people when they saw it gave praise to God was that got what got Zacchaeus thinking man if he can do that for him maybe he can help me too because remember what we said a moment ago what Jesus did for the man before us he will do for any one of us now we can't be a hundred percent sure but it seems like Zacchaeus understood that concept too 
Zacchaeus knew something of Jesus. He knew enough of Jesus to know he had helped some other people, and perhaps he could help him at his own intersection as he was trying to figure out life himself. He had identified enough to know he needed to see Jesus and figure out who he was. You see, when you identify that you're at one of life's many intersections, I want to encourage you to do these next three things. Because identifying the intersection is great, but you have to realize what's going to happen next at any intersection in life you come to. The first thing is the word investigate. And I want to encourage you to investigate, but I want to encourage you to investigate the right thing. You see, intersections are places in life where we're ready to investigate. We're ready to try to figure it out. We're ready to do anything to make it better. We're willing to consider things we wouldn't have considered yesterday. We're willing to try things we wouldn't have tried last week. We're willing to attempt things we would have never attempted before in our life. But when we come to a major intersection in life, we begin to investigate how can this be made better? How can I be made well? How can this get fixed? That's exactly what Zacchaeus is doing. He's trying to see who Jesus was. He was willing to investigate. He was willing to try to figure it out. He was willing to climb up into a tree. I'm sure he'd never thought weeks before, months before, you know, I think next time somebody famous passes through, I'll just climb a tree. But he was willing to do that because he was investigating. He was curious. He was hungry. He was willing to do anything at this intersection in his own life to figure out who is Jesus. But here's the problem with intersections and identifying them and investigating as we're in them. Many times they don't always lead us to investigate the right things. Church, this is why we tell you to be in your Bibles. This is why we tell you to do a devotion. This is why we encourage you to be at church. It's why we encourage you to be in a small group. Because when your kids come to an intersection in life, you want to know what the first thing they're going to do is? They're going to start investigating. And they're going to go to their friends and investigate. And they're going to go to their friends and investigate. They're going to go to YouTube and investigate. As they get older, they're going to go to their coworkers and investigate. And they're willing to do anything to try to figure out and make sense of whatever it is that's going on in their head, in their mind, in their heart, in their life at that moment. And hopefully they're going to come to you and investigate as well. But if you don't have an answer for them, if you don't point them back to God's word, they're probably going to go and follow something else that won't be the right thing. This is why so many people get addicted to drugs and alcohol at intersections in life. Because they come to a major intersection, they don't know how to deal with it, and they start to investigate, and a friend says, hey, come over and have a beer with me. And that beer turns into a case of beer, and that one night turns into a week of nights, and that week of nights turns into a month of nights. Before you know it, you're a full-blown alcoholic. You can't function without it. Or somebody says, hey, hey, smoke a little of this, or put a little, here, I got a little something to take the edge off. Let me, let me give you a little shot of this. Most of the people who get addicted to drugs and alcohol, they get so at, at intersections in life because they start investigating, how can I make this better? It's not the right thing, but, but they, get, they get addicted to those things. It's why so many at these intersections in life get sucked into cults and false religions. I can't tell you how many people that that I've counseled over the years that have come out of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormon religions and and these, these false religions that are out there. And almost every one of them to a T got sucked into those at an intersection in life, a time they were going through a divorce or a difficulty or a hardship, and somebody knocked on their door and had an answer for them. They didn't fall into the right thing, but they were investigating, and somebody was there at that moment to lead them astray. It's why so many of our younger people today are getting into homosexuality and 
all the other sexual sins that go along with it because they come to these major intersections in life and somebody says, hey, I'll, I'll give you something that'll make you feel better for that. Hey, come try this. Come investigate this. It doesn't mean you are that. Just come give it a try. And they follow their friends right into whatever trap it is that Satan sets for them because that's what happens at an intersection. You're willing to investigate. You're ready to investigate. It's the natural thing to want to investigate it. It's what Zacchaeus was doing. He was investigating. He was trying to figure it out. And that's why I'm telling you it's important that you can identify the intersections of life for yourself and for others. You need to be able to see when a coworker or a friend or a family member or a child is at an intersection in life. You need to be able to see it for yourself too. As you yourself approach that intersection, you should proceed with great caution. And at that intersection, you better, you better put your little antennas up and say, I know I'm at an intersection of life. I'm going to be very careful to listen to the right people over the next two weeks. I'm going to be very careful where I go and who I allow to speak into my life because I know I'm at a vulnerable intersection in life. For other people around you, as you see them approaching an intersection in life, that should cause you to pray for them. It should cause you to check on them. It should cause you to invite them to church. It should cause you to invite them to read the Bible with you, to share the gospel with them. It should cause you to remind them that what Jesus did for the man before them, he will do for them too. It should cause us to make sure that they understand that Jesus loves them and has a plan for their life, that it should prompt us to tell them to investigate Jesus more than anything else. Because it's natural to investigate when we hit an intersection in life. The next thing that we need to do is initiate. I, I love this. Jesus sees this man up in a tree investigating him. And Jesus immediately identifies that this man is seeking that this man is hungry, that this man is at an intersection of life, why else would a grown man climb up into a tree? And so Jesus says in verse 5, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. Jesus initiated the conversation. Did you see that? Jesus initiated the interaction. Jesus says, hurry up and get out of that tree, you silly little man. I need to come to your house. This isn't normal, but it's what Jesus did because Jesus was able to identify that that man was at an intersection in life. You see, and most of us don't want to do that, do we? Earlier today, I asked you to take selfies with the people around you, and I saw some of you go, ooh, no, scary, scary, scary. Bad man, ask me to take pictures. No. Much less go up and initiate a conversation with someone who is at a major intersection in life. We don't want to do that, do we? Most of the time we say, I'm just going to sit back and kind of see what happens. I'm going to wait. It's kind of like when you pull up to that four-way stop with three other cars all pretty much at the same time, and everybody's looking at each other like, Who, who's going to go first? And then you finally get the nerve to kind of ease out there, and about the time you do, somebody else does, and so you hit your brakes and they hit theirs, and they're doing this and you're doing this, and everybody's doing this to each other, and nobody knows who's going to go first. You go, no, you go, no, you go, no, you go. No, you, no, you go. Everybody's waiting for everybody else. That's what happens a lot at the intersections of life, I feel like. A lot of us are just waiting for everybody else. When we see people in a major intersection in life, we shouldn't wait. We should pull up. We should get into their business. Say, hey, what's going on? Our natural reaction is to say, well, they'll call me if they need me. They know I'm here. I, I don't want to bother them. You know what the best thing you can probably do right then and there is bother them. Reach out and get in their business. Jesus said, hey Zacchaeus, 
Get down out of that tree. I'm going to your house today. He put Zacchaeus in a big spotlight. He initiated the conversation. Get out of that tree and take me to your house. He initiated it. Jesus wanted everybody there to know and understand this thing. What Jesus did for the man before us, he will do for any one of us, even Zacchaeus. Now look at this last word. When we identify we're in an intersection, or when we identify that somebody we know is at an intersection in life, we need to integrate. Specifically, we need to integrate our faith into whatever that situation is. It's at these intersections in life that we are most likely to integrate faith into life. If you're able to identify intersections in your life and in the lives of others, I promise you, you're going to have an opportunity to integrate faith into that moment. If you can learn to be sensitive and if you can learn to see with your heart as much as with your eyes, and if you can have the boldness to initiate the conversation, God is going to give you an opportunity to integrate faith into life. Now, we don't have access to all the details here. We don't get the full conversation here. Luke is the only gospel that records this story, and he doesn't tell us everything. But here's what it says in verses 6 through 10. So he quickly came down. He welcomed him joyfully, and all who saw it began to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man, they said. But Zacchaeus stood there, and he said to the Lord, Lord, look, I'll give half my possessions to the poor. Lord, If I have exhorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. And then in verse 9, Jesus says, Today salvation has come to this house. And Jesus told him, Because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Something spiritual happened between verse 6 and verse 8 that we're not given the details of. We see a great transformation take place in a sinner's life. We see spiritual fruit between verse 6 and verse 8. We see spiritual fruit get ripe in Zacchaeus' life. I'll give half my possessions away. I'll pay back four times if I've stolen anything from anybody. We see a transformed and repentant heart laid open in verse 8 when Zacchaeus stood there and said, Lord, look, I'll give half of it away. Lord, if I've exhorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. He just lays his heart open, not only for Jesus, but for everybody. And in verse 9, Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. So we know something spiritual happened in that man's heart. I love what John MacArthur wrote about this. He said, the story of Zacchaeus' conversion is one of the clearest biblical illustrations of God seeking a specific sinner. That man in the midst of a massive crowd had a divine appointment with the seeking, saving Lord. Jesus located him, called him by name, and pursued him to salvation. Jesus knew this man was at a major intersection and he used that to bring him to a saving faith. And again, we must be reminded that what Jesus did for the man before us, he will do for any one of us. There's not much known about what happened to Zacchaeus after this day. But you might be surprised to learn that according to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, there was a man by the name of Zacchaeus who's mentioned in a document outside the Bible called the Clementine Homilies. And he's mentioned as having been the companion of the Apostle Peter and appointed the bishop of Caesarea. Furthermore, according to Clement of Alexandria in his book, Stromata, Zacchaeus was surnamed Matthias. And he says that Zacchaeus is the Matthias that takes the place of Judas Iscariot after Jesus ascends to heaven. It's funny. 
The name Zacchaeus means clean or pure. Funny, don't you think? His name meant clean and pure, and when Jesus rolled into Jericho, he was probably the dirtiest man there. And he was at an intersection of life trying to deal with all that dirt and mire and grime all over him, and he was anything but clean. He's one of the dirtiest people and the most despised people in his society as the chief tax collector. If indeed, and we, we can't know for sure, I stress the if, but if indeed he is the Matthias we see in the book of Acts, you know what that name means, Matthias? It means the gift of God. Zacchaeus Matthias. Clean gift of God. We can't be sure it's the same man. We can't be certain that at the end of the day, after this meeting with Jesus, at that intersection in life, Zacchaeus was indeed the one who goes on to be that disciple. But we can be certain of this. At the end of this day with Jesus, Zacchaeus is saved. His soul is clean. Because Jesus himself proclaimed, today salvation has come to this house. Because he too is the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. Can I remind you one last time what Jesus did for the man before us? He will do for any one of us. Will today be the day that you call on Jesus here at this intersection of your life? Will today be the day that you're washed clean? Will today be the day that you come to know the Son of God as your Lord and Savior? Will today be the day that salvation comes to your house like it did his? What Jesus did for the man before you, he will do for you. If you will cry out and confess that Jesus is Lord and repent of your sins this hour. Jesus is ready and willing. Call on him this day. Let's pray. If that's you and you have never called on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to do so right now. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would come into my life and change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new. I ask by faith that you would save me from my sins and give me the great gift of eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your goodness for meeting me here today. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for those who have called on you for the first time this hour. We thank you for the truth that what you have done for those before us, you will do for any one of us. We hold on to that promise as right now in this place, at this very hour, there are many at an intersection in life. And we are also reminded that we are not the first to stand at such an intersection. Many have gone before us you have met their needs, you have been sufficient for them, and you will be for us too. So give us confidence as we navigate, and even if we have to deviate, give us confidence knowing that you're with us and will guide us through it. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we ask your blessing now in Jesus' name, amen. Church, if you